I want to take my opportunity tonight to welcome all of you that are here, and especially do I want to welcome those of the military that are here. Now tonight, I want us to turn to the eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel. The eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel, beginning with verse 31. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now notice when Jesus called his disciples, he never hid from them the fact that to follow him meant suffering, persecution, and death. We have a great deal of what someone has called cheap grace. Easy to follow Christ. Easy to follow, get in the church. In Jesus' day, he called them to suffering. He didn't call them to a playground, he called them to a battlefield. He called them to war, spiritual war. And he said, you're going to suffer and you're going to be wounded and you're going to die in my cause because the world is going to reject me. This world that's dominated by evil and sin will reject me. And if you follow me, you too may end up on a cross. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. Now the Bible teaches that you have a body, but living down inside of your body is your soul or your spirit. I'm not going to try to distinguish tonight because that's a technical theological discussion between soul and spirit. I'm going to use them interchangeably. Your soul is that part of you made in the image of God that lives inside of you and that's the eternal part of you. That's the important part of you. That's the real you. That's the part of you that will be living a thousand years from now, either in heaven or hell. The real you, your body will be in the grave until the resurrection. Jesus said, one soul is worth the whole world. You may gain the whole world and awaken one morning to find that you've missed the most important thing in all of life. Why is it so valuable? Why is your soul so valuable? First, it's valuable because it is eternal. The body is a beautiful structure, but it is matter. No matter how strong it will die. It's appointed that the man wants to die. You're going to die. Your body is going to go to the grave. Unless you're alive when Christ comes back. Death is man's greatest impersonal enemy. According to 1 Corinthians 15. So many of the great actors and actresses we've seen on television are already dead. I think of Donna Reed. My wife and I were friends of Donna Reed. Starring last year in Dallas. Now she's dead. A Rock Hudson. Acting on the screen. So handsome. Dead. And you can name one after another. Dead. Fame, fortune. Cannot keep away death. How abused was the richest man possibly in the United States when he died. But he died. A horrible death. 
miserable life toward the end of his life. So many people like that. And somehow they think they're going to live forever. You tell young people that life is short and they sort of smile and say yes, but I've got at least 30 or 40 years ahead. Let me tell you, it goes just like that. I can tell you, somebody asked me on one of my birthdays, I'm not going to tell you which one. They said, when you get, when you were 65 way back there, what was your greatest surprise in life? I said, the brevity of life. That's the greatest surprise of my life is how brief it is. It's gone. I feel like a boy. Sometimes I feel like I'm 18. Again, I feel my real age. But it passes so fast. And then the soul, just as this body has various members like hands and nose and ears and eyes, feet, so the soul has its various faculties and attributes. First, there's understanding, wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. Toynbee said, man by his knowledge has brought himself to total annihilation. Yes, we can have knowledge, but we don't have the wisdom to control our technology. But wisdom and knowledge are a part of our soul. And judgment, which weighs and determines and makes judgments every day in our lives. Or your will, which chooses or rejects the things brought before it. Or your affections, which cause you to fear or to love. Memory which is the mental capacity for storing up our knowledge of ideas and events. Conscience, which is the monitor of the soul, judges and pronounces verdicts upon all that we do or say. All of that is a part of our soul that will live forever. Now science, producing living cells, talks of protoplasm. Protoplasm by themselves cannot smile in the midst of pain. Nor can protoplasms love the unlovely, nor generate high hope in times of disaster. They cannot contemplate God. There's something beyond science, and the scientists know it. The Bible calls it soul. What is it when a person dies? The body's there, the organs are there, but something has gone out of the body. The soul, the spirit, has gone out of the body. Where has it gone? Job says, but there's a spirit in man. And in Ecclesiastes it says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto the God who gave it. Now which do you care for if you're a parent? A child's clothes or the child? A servant says, here are the clothes, they're neat and clean, but the child got lost. What would you think of that? And that's what we say. We've taken care of our body, Lord. Here's my body. I didn't neglect it. I took exercises, all those exercises on TV that Jane Fonda has or somebody else has got. I did all those things. I jogged regularly. I ate the proper foods, and boy, did I take the vitamins and the minerals and packages of them, whole fistfuls a day. And I went to see the doctor regular. I went to see the dentist every six months. My body is in good shape until it died. And Lord, I took care of it, but I neglected my soul. I didn't feed the soul. I didn't give any vitamins to the soul. I never read the scriptures, your word. I never spent any time talking to you and developing myself spiritually. I didn't obey you when you told me to love my neighbor. I didn't obey you when you talked about that neighbor down the street that was hungry or that neighbor that was in need of a friend that was lonely. I just didn't have time for things like that, but Lord, I really took care of the body.